Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Gallo. I'm a contributing editor here at Harvard Business Review. And today we're here at HBR's Boston office and we're going to do a workshop on how to write a resume that stands out. To help us in this endeavor, we've invited an expert, Jane Heifetz. Jane is a former editor at HBR and the founder and owner of Write Resumes. She is the perfect person to do this workshop. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to start by talking about a few myths about resumes, things you think might be true or always thought were true, and we're going to bust some of those commonly held myths. Then we're going to look at a before and after version of a resume that well, one of Jane's clients. We'll look at three sections in, in, in particular, the summary section, the experience section, and the skills section. And then, of course, we'll take your questions, as we always do. So Jane and I will be doing a lot of talking, but we want you to participate in this workshop as well. Please use the comments section to send us myths that you think are true or that you want busted, any questions you have about any part of the resume. Um, we'll take questions about specific parts of the resume as we go, um, but then we'll take more general questions at the end. So let us know your thoughts um, and concerns. So let's get started. So Jane, I want to start with some of the most commonly held myths. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones that um, I have to say I know is not true, but I often hold on to is that a resume is a chronological list of your work experience. Right, so um, while listing your jobs and your responsibilities is absolutely necessary information to include in your resume, it's by far not sufficient at all. And mm -hmm. why is that? Well, a number of things. One, if all you do is list your responsibilities, your res resume will start to sound exactly like lots of other candidates for that position that you're dying to get. So that's a problem. Um, also, only listing your responsibilities doesn't tell the hiring manager or the recruiter how well you fulfill those responsibilities. So mm -hmm. again, you run the risk of sounding like everybody else and you don't, have, you don't give yourself the opportunity to really distinguish yourself and prove to the hiring manager that you've solved problems just like the one that she's facing in her organization and you are ready to roll up your sleeves and help her do what she needs to get done. So yeah. you need a lot more um, of a story to tell in your resume than simply your listing of responsibilities. Right. Which telling stories is much harder than listing responsibilities. Much harder, so, yes. But we'll get to how Absolutely. to do that. Yeah. Um, so speaking of hiring managers, this, the second myth I wanted to talk about was that your resume would be carefully read by hiring managers or recruiters. Is this true? Oh, it's so not true. <laughs> <laughs> so put yourself in the shoes of a very busy hiring manager or recruiter. You've got tons of positions you have to fill. Uh, other people in your company are breathing down your neck, wondering why you haven't sent them resumes to look at. You don't have much time, and you need a way to quickly filter those hundreds of resumes into the uh, recycle bin or the to be read more carefully pile. And the best way for you to do that, to help out the hiring manager or recruiter, is to have a very compelling headline and summary section right at the top of your resume. So you've got 10 seconds to grab that reader's attention. You absolutely have to do that in the, in the headline and summary. So okay. And we'll talk a lot about the summary section. Yeah. But one more myth before we get there. Yes. Um, I want to ask about the size of your resume. This is a debate. I often hear. So yes. the myth that your resume has to fit on one page no matter what. Right. Is that true? Well, I've actually almost gotten into fights with my clients about <laughs> that who, who swear up and down that one page is absolutely what they know that they need to be doing. And while I'm often an advocate of less is more, in this case, less is not more. Um, and why is that? Well, if you are actually following my recommendation to focus on accomplishments and to distinguish yourself, you simply can't do that in one page unless maybe you're, uh, you just graduated from college and you don't have much to talk about. But other than that, you have lots more to tell in your, your professional uh, narrative. So the other problem uh, that people who are hell-bent on squeezing everything into one page is they use the tiniest font that they can possibly find that really requires someone to get out her magnifying glass to read it. And they make the margins at the top and at the sides as narrow as possible. And they leave no white space um, anywhere on the page. So it's this mass of condensed text that is actually a discouragement mm -hmm. to read. And undoubtedly, if somebody gets one of those, 
into the recycle bin it will go. So instead, you need to give your res <coughs> excuse me, breathing space. You need to make it easy for the reader to quickly skim and figure out that you are a candidate whose resume is worth reading more carefully. So regular size margins, no smaller than a 10 uh, point font, mm -hmm. plenty of white space between sections, bolded headers so that somebody could quickly read and zero in on the material that's most relevant to her posting. Right. Okay, that's really useful. So let's move on to the resumes that you brought. So yep. this is, you brought a before and an after for William Jordan V. He right. generously offered to let us um, look at both his before and after version. Before we get into um, the details, can you just give us a little bit of context about your work with William, where he was in his career when he came to you? Absolutely. So first of all, I want to thank William uh, enormously for so graciously allowing me to, allowing us to use his resumes uh, in this workshop. Um, I also want to point out that the, both the before and after versions that we're looking at, are they're now about two years old. Um, William has since uh, ended up staying at his company and being promoted to VP of Commercial Development, so he's done quite well. Um, and he came to me at a point where he was just starting to consider the possibility of exploring other um, opportunities with other startups, um, and he wanted help telling his very varied and extensive uh, professional story in a more cohesive, compelling way. So that's what we did together. Great. Okay, well let's start at the top where yep. all good resumes start. Yep. Now William, and we'll, we'll, let's, we're gonna talk about the summary section. So if anyone has any questions specifically about the summary section, feel free to put them in the comments now. Um, my colleague Nicole is here. When we pause for questions, she'll let us know um, what you've asked. Yep. So William, it looks like, has this about section yep. and a select achievements section. I've actually never seen both of those. Um, can you tell us what wasn't working about this yep. for you? Yep, so let's look at William's. and. Um, I want to point out that before we get uh, too much into the analysis, that there's actually a lot of good material here. Um, but what William and I were able to do is bring his good material into much um, higher relief to make a more compelling resume. So William started out, as many people do, by labeling this first section about. What's wrong with that? He took this unbelievably prime real estate, perhaps the most important real estate on his whole resume, and used a word that doesn't communicate anything about him. Mm. A lot of people use the, uh, the word summary up here, and I have to confess that I used to do that years ago in, in resumes that I worked on. Um, but um, we will talk uh, in a moment about how to actually write a, a very effective um, headline here, but about is not a good way to start. Mm. Um, then he goes into his, uh, what I call his summary pitch. And overall, what we'll see is that this pitch talks a lot uh, more about what he's looking for in his next opportunity and not quite enough in what somebody reading his resume would be looking for. So he starts out, well, he says, my professional endeavors are entrepreneurial. So I know right away that he's been in the startup space, which is great because mm -hmm. I'm a recruiter for a startup company or a hiring manager. But then he starts to lose my attention almost immediately by saying he's interested in exploring the intersection of passion, interest, and skill development. Well, that's interesting information about William, but this is not the place to put it. Uh, this is, again, he's still in that really critical real estate um, space, and he can talk about that stuff in a cover letter or in an interview when he's speaking more informally to, to someone, but that's not the place to do it. Well, let me ask about that because I think a lot of us use the word passion in cover letters or, yeah. or resumes. Yeah. Um, why is this not the right place to show that you really want this job or that this is the right job for right. you? Because you haven't yet distinguished yourself from all of the other candidates, mm -hmm. so you will have time to do that, but not there. Okay. That's not the time. Um, I just want to point out one other thing that way down here in the fourth line of his summary pitch, he talks about uh, developing meaningful brands into great ones and having some fun along the way. That's also I very interesting information about William, but it's too late. He, he lost me a couple lines ago. So again, we'll talk about how he can incorporate that in the in the after version of his resume, but that's not the right place. Okay. So then he goes on as, uh, actually many people have a select accomplishments section. Mm -hmm. um, and here we'll see that he starts to get much more concrete about his accomplishments, which starts to get um, much more uh, into what a resume reader would be looking for. In particular, here's a great one. He says he led his company-wide business development culminating in 300, 
50% sales increases in less than three years. Very impressive. Indeed, yeah. Um, but so what's wrong with this section? Well, what's wrong with it is it's kind of a fragmented list of bullet points. He bounces around from his current company, Axion, and doesn't tell you what Axion is. Um, he then talks about his work with a brewery, which he founded uh, with his cousins. Um, and then he, in this last section here, he has links to three news stories about his current company that I'm sure has very, all of them have very interesting information about his work there, but he's asking the reader to work way too hard, right? Who is going to have the time to click on those links and actually read those stories and go, oh yes, William is fabulous, I want to talk to him. Mm -hmm. He actually is fabulous and he should be talked to, but that's not the way to get your resume reader's attention. So overall, this section is missing the context of what was his larger story um, at these companies? What was his legacy? How did he improve them? And then, as you'll see in his after version, those bullet points start to make a whole lot more sense. Okay, well let's go to the after version actually, because yep. I think that, it, first of all, the summary section is so much shorter. Yep. Um, we're looking at four lines here as opposed to almost, you know, Half the, half the page. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what you and, and William did? Yeah, so right off the bat, um, here we see a very effective headline that's remarkably different from the word about. So William describes himself uh, in three short phrases as a startup builder, a brand strategist, and a marketing head. So in those six words, William has told me a huge amount about himself. And he noticed the order in which he lists those. He starts with the, the descriptor that's most all-encompassing. I'm a startup builder. That implies to me that he's had a wide range of experience helping startups get going and growing and being fabulous. He then goes down one level below that and describes himself as a brand strategist. So he's someone who thinks deeply and smartly about brands. And then he goes down one level further from that and describes himself as a marketing head. So he's not just a big thinker about brands, he actually gets brands out there and working. And he has apparently led a team of marketing people to actually do that. So mm. unbelievably powerful line there. And you can see how different that is from his about right. uh, descriptor in his um, before version. Right, and in just six words, yeah. he's communicated an incredible amount those, you know, that six seconds that your yep. hiring manager is looking at this, they've already got so much information. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So he doesn't stop there, of course. Um, he then has four very concrete bullet points about the work that he's done that uh, proves that he's actually done all the things he claims in his, in his uh, headline. So let's look at a couple of them. He starts out by saying that he builds startups commercial infrastructures from the ground up driving long-term growth and profitability. So what's so effective about that? Well, again, he's reinforcing the fact that he came into this, this startup, rolled up his sleeves, and created the infrastructures that many startups struggle with. So he, throughout, you will see that he's highlighting things that are very important, very relevant to any other startup. So he got in there, he built these infrastructures from the ground up, and in particular, he did them in a way that drove not just short-term growth, which lots of startups do, but long-term growth and profitability. So he continues to distinguish himself from other people who have worked um, in startups. Mm. That's a great bullet. Uh, his second bullet, he, he notes that he crafts brand identities that position products and companies to capture number one category positions. Well, if he hadn't gotten me now, now he's completely gotten my attention. What startup would not be thrilled to have somebody come in and join them who could take their fledgling business and you know, help it grow fairly quickly to the number one position in their category, yeah. you know. Let me ask you a question about that because that is an impressive accomplishment. Yeah. Um, one of the questions when I talk to people about the resumes is, um, is it okay to brag? Yeah. And it certainly, that is a great accomplishment. Yeah. Um, one could argue that, you know, it's bragging. What do you say to that? One, one could argue with that. Um, <laughs> one could call it bragging, but I would strongly encourage you to ban the word bragging from your vocabulary and just get over it. Um, if you are going to distinguish yourself from other candidates, you have to say what you have done. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way around that. And if you are truthfully telling the story of what you've done, I don't consider that bragging. I just consider that stating the facts, ma'am. Right. Um, so go forth and 
brag all you want. Um, right. Those are the most effective resumes to so, me. So get over yourself. Absolutely get over it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, and let me ask another question because craft. I hear craft brand identities. I'm assuming William didn't sit in an office by himself and craft these brand identities. He likely had a team he worked with, partners Absolutely. in a different part of the organization. How do you give credit where right. credit's due in a resume? Right. So I, I hear that question a lot, um, and unfortunately, I hear it way more often from women than from men. Mm. Um, and what I say to that <coughs> legitimate concern is anybody reading this kind of resume will assume that you are not in a room by yourself crafting a brand strategy and then rolling it out. Nobody can do that kind of work um, on his or her own. So the assumption within, and you'll see this throughout William's resume, is that he had a team of people working with him. But he led that team. Mm -hmm. He had the vision, the strategy for what that brand was going to be and how to most effectively craft it and bring it into the market. So he is absolutely due um, that statement, mm -hmm. and again, I can't imagine anyone assuming that he did it by himself. Right. Um, I want to just point out the, the last bullet in his summary. He notes that he in inspires teams to thrive. Lots of people, you may say, claim that. How does that distinguish William from everybody else? Um, and you're right, they do, but he qualifies it by saying that he inspires those teams even in unforgiving retail environments and intensely competitive marketing sectors. So he continuously, almost in every line of his resume, he's talking about himself in a way that distinguishes his work from other people's. Mm -hmm. Lastly, he talks about building trust and accountability with exacting standards. Again, lots of people claim that, but once again, he qualifies that by noting that he uses inclusiveness and humor. So I'm really interested in him. Like, how does he use humor? Is he really a funny guy? I want him, I want him to come in so I can find out. Right. Uh, he's really piqued my interest. Uh, so we can see this is a much better version um, from what William had before. Yeah. Let's talk to our audience, just give some tips about how they can tackle this section, because yeah. this was very specific to William, but what are some yeah. tips for how they can write their summary yeah, section? So my first tip, um, you may be surprised to hear, is don't write your summary first. Mm -hmm. It's way too hard. Um, if you try to write your headline and summary first, you'll likely get bogged down in it and either abandon your resume project altogether or feel the need to hire somebody like me to help you, which <laughs> I'm not encouraging you to do. Um, so table it for now and instead uh, draft the experience section of your resume. And <coughs> we're going to talk a lot more about that in a minute, but what I would strongly recommend is before you even consider drafting the rest of your resume and then looping back to your summary is pick a job posting that you would kill to get, um, one that you're really excited to apply for. Reread it really, really carefully and literally make a checklist of the five or six most important responsibilities and requirements for that job. Keep that checklist with you literally at your elbow and as you start to think about what to talk about in your experience section and then again in your summary, keep those five or six requirements and responsibilities in mind and be sure to match your um, experience as closely as possible with what that job posting is looking for. So are you suggesting that we customize our resume for every job we're applying for? Uh, no. First of all, if you're applying for s similar kinds of positions, they're probably going to have almost identical requirements and responsibilities, so you don't have to customize them for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but you do need to make sure that you're putting things in the right order. For example, in your headline, um, you, you probably will only have to customize your headline and your summary section, but unlikely the body of your resume. But yes, the possibility of um, tailoring them to each job posting is, should very much be on your mind. Okay, okay, great. So I think we might have some questions about the summary section. We'll take those now. Yeah, so we've gotten two questions related to summaries. Um, both kind of asking, you know, if you're switching industries or if you have a gap in your resume, should you put that in your summary? How much of your entire working experience should you include in that section? Good question. Um, you certainly don't want to call out the gap. Uh, in your work history, absolutely not in your, in your summary section for sure. If you are applying for a position in a different industry, the same advice would apply only in spades, meaning look, read, read, read really carefully that job posting from that other industry and make sure that you're pulling out of it um, the kind of work that you've done that's most relevant to that new industry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we'll see in Williams, for example, is that all the things that he highlights um, in his startup work, it, 
all of those things are relevant to any startup. Um, the same thing you would need to do if you're switching industries. Make sure that you are thinking carefully and then highlighting appropriately the stuff that's most relevant to that other industry. I want to return to the first part of that question because the, about the gap in work history. Yeah. I'm sure you get this question a yeah. lot. Where should that be addressed? Is that a cover letter, interview? When do you, when do you actually bring that up? Um, it depends on the size of the gap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't think it belongs on your resume at all. Mm -hmm. um, but also think about what, one of the questions I ask clients is what were you doing during that gap? If you were doing volunteer work, and that volunteer work is relevant to the kinds of positions that you're applying for, feel free to incorporate that into the descending chronological story of your work history. It doesn't matter that it was volunteer. I don't care whether or not you got paid. What I care is that you did work that's relevant to the position that I'm offering. And I say that from having been a hiring manager for 30 plus years. Um, it's not the amount of pay or lack thereof that you got. It's what were you doing that's relevant. Mm -hmm. You can certainly address the gap if need be in an interview, but I wouldn't, the resume is not the place to do it. Okay. Another question about the summary section. Yes, so Johnny is asking how important are keywords in the summary? So buzzwords, industry specific jargon. Yeah, so again, if you have um, done what I suggested, which is to reread that job posting really carefully and made your checklist of five or six most important responsibilities and requirements, in order for you to talk about your work as related to those responsibilities and requirements, you will have had to have incorporated keywords um, in that writing. So. Right. Um, what this person may be asking about is a lot of people have a section under their summary that, that just lists keywords like, uh, I don't know, social media, um, SEO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the problem is that if you just list those, yes, it tells me that you've had experience in those areas, but it doesn't tell me how well you worked in them. So it doesn't right. distinguish you from other people who may also have had that kind of experience. So I do not recommend that kind of block, you know, uh, list of, of those keywords. I, if you need them, they belong up here in your summary section. And then they belong highlighted in the whole body of your resume. So let's look at them, because you brought two other examples yeah. of summaries. Um, and let's look at those, because I do think those are helpful in terms of how people are using keywords. We'll yep. start with, we have a pharmaceutical marketing executive. Yep. Um, and I'll just read this. So 20 years of experience creating pharmaceutical companies, commercial infrastructures, growing their brands and optimizing their products value throughout launch, relaunch, and sunset life cycles across all customer segments, payers, physicians, and patients. Lead global marketing and commercial operations teams with P&Ls up to $2 billion. Do you want to talk yeah. about what, what's working there? Yeah. So um, this individual um, obviously is a pharmaceutical marketing executive. That has been her entire career, and that's the kind of position she's continuing to look for. So unlike William, who had a three-part headline, she only needs a one-part headline because it's very, very specific. Um, the mistake that she could have made was just to describe herself as a marketing executive. That doesn't tell me, as somebody who's recruiting for a big pharma company, that she's had a ton of pharmaceutical experience. So she absolutely wants to include that uh, in her headline. Then she goes on to note the extent of her years of work in that field, which is great. Um, she distinguishes herself by noting that she's had experience across all phases of the product's life cycle, from launch to relaunch to sunset, that she's also worked across all customer segments in the pharma industry, payers, physicians, and patients. And she ends by saying that she's led global marketing and commercial operations teams with P&Ls up to $2 billion. That's a great way, that's a real zinger to end her summary by going, oh my god, $2 billion, this woman hasn't been fooling around. She's got a huge amount of experience. She's absolutely somebody I want to talk with. Right. Well, good. We have another example, too. Let's, I think it could be helpful. So let's look at that. It's an online ad sales innovator and leader. So 12 years of experience leading sales teams in startup, rapidly growing and established companies, maximize profitability of online ads across all platforms, including games, mobile, social, and web, consistently exceed revenue targets, even when battling Facebook and other relentless competitors in crowded markets. Okay, so again, this guy could have just described himself as a sales leader, but again, he has particular experience in online ad sales, and that's the kind of position he was applying for, so it was important for him to note that. He, like the previous example, notes the number of years he's been doing this work. He 
um, notes his range of experience in types of businesses from startup to growing to established. He talks about maximizing profitability, so very interesting to hear because it's, he's not just generating revenue, he's generating profitable revenue, and he's done it across a wide range of platforms, games, mobile, social web. And then his last killer statement at the end is that he consistently exceeds revenue targets, which a lot of people, again, claim to do, but he qualifies it big time by saying, even when battling Facebook and other relentless competitors in crowded markets now, if he hadn't gotten my attention before, which he had, he certainly got it now. I want him to come in and talk to me about how did you battle Facebook? Right. What happened as a result of that? Um, if I'm a startup, undoubtedly I've got a Facebook in my crowded market that I need help battling, so he's my guy. Right. I, I need to talk to him. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing that one phrase or one clause really um, you know, gives so much context to what could be a generic phrase. Exactly. Um, I think that's really nice. Yeah, it's a great distinguisher. Good. So yeah. let's just summarize what for the summary section, um, the advice here, which is don't write your summary first. Um, do it after you've done the experience section. Tailor the headline and your summary to each job and avoid generic terms and jargon at all costs. Um, all right, let's go back to Williams before and talk about his experience section. Now, I'll admit this is where my resume starts, so we've already debunked the myth that you don't need a summary section. You absolutely do. Um, but let's talk about the um, experience section. What was going on for William yep. before you um, change the resume. Yep. So again, this is not horrifying at all. Um, it's a pretty typical looking resume. He starts out by listing his the, what were then his two positions at his current company, Axion, and he lists under his VP position uh, the first bullet, which is marketing colon advertising, branding, research, packaging, segmentation, and trademarks. So what's wrong with that bullet? It's a, it certainly gives me information about the range of his responsibilities within marketing, but again, it doesn't tell me how well he fulfilled those responsibilities. It doesn't set it in the context of what has Williams' overall um, legacy, as it were, been at this company? What have been the major transformations that he's led there? So um, all four of these bullets are pretty similar in that regard, and they all will become much more powerful, as you'll see in the after version of his, of his Well, and this is one of the myths I think that you wanted to debunk is that your experience section should be a list of one-line bullets. Right, right. Which mine is, so yeah. I'll, I'll admit yeah. mine looks a lot like this. Yeah. But and that's not the case, right? No, um, so the good thing about one-line bullets is they're easy to read. Uh, the bad thing about one-line bullets is they're not, they're missing the, that larger context, that larger, the bigger picture of the work that you have done um, at each, in each of your positions at each of your companies. And in order for me to really understand how impressive your work has been at each of your companies, in order to distinguish you, again, from other candidates, you need more text than that. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll talk about how to do that in a second. Okay. Well, let's look at then. Let's look what you did with that section. Yep. This looks very different. It's yep. not a list of bullets. There's yep. actually quite a lot of um, sentences here. Can yep. you tell us what you what you did? Yeah. So um, William has a particularly interesting story to tell, but yours will probably be just as interesting. <laughs> he starts out by saying that he was the eighth person to join this now 178 person manufacturer of recycled plastic building materials. So in that first line. He's told me that he was there, not at the very, very beginning of the startup, but pretty close to it. Uh, and he's been there as the company has grown exponentially. He then goes on to say, uh, oh, also, he tells us what kind of company Axion is, which mm. was one of the pieces of information that was missing from his uh, before version. <coughs> and I find that really helpful. A lot of, I mean, it, it's one thing if you work for Google or Facebook, right? right? But it's a different if you work for something called Axion International. Reviewing exactly. resumes, it's really hard to understand the context in which the person works. Exactly. Worked. If you happen to have worked for a company whose, whose name is very familiar, you don't have to explain what it is, but in all other cases, you do need a quick uh, descriptor. Um, he then goes on to say in this first sentence that um, that he created from scratch its brand strategy and fully functioning commercial infrastructure. Now you may say, well, why does he have to say that here? Because he already set it up here in his summary. And the reason is <coughs> he's now talking about his overall work at Axion, so he needs a quick repeat of that, which is fine. He then goes on to write um, what is 
arguably a rather long uh, second paragraph to his introduction, and introductions aren't usually this long, but in the case of William, who has had such an impact on his company and has had such a range of experience there that it's worth writing that much, and we'll see why. So he goes on to say that in four years, he enabled Axion to become the upstart David to the Goliath of traditional steel railway tie manufacturers. Wow, he just did something very impressive here. He took his experience in this you know, very specific kind of company. There aren't a lot of companies who specialize in recycled plastics material to build railway ties. Sure. Um, so it's probably not relevant to a lot of other startups. But what is relevant, and this is what he does repeatedly throughout his resume, is he takes that very specific example and he makes it relevant by using the David and Goliath analogy, which everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And as a recruiter or a hiring manager for a startup, wouldn't you love to have somebody on your team who can help you battle your Goliath, just like that online ad sales, sales guy battled Facebook? Right. Well, and then I noticed he has these sections. The, here are those keywords that, that our viewer was asking about, right? Yep. Strategy, development, and execution, brand, and marketing. Um, this is not a list of responsibilities in chronological order. No. Why did you divide it up this way? Right. So. All of these headers that are, first of all, notice the white space between the sections, easy to read, bolded, easy to read. Um, strategy development, branding and marketing, sales processes, supply chain and IT infrastructures, IP and trademark development, <coughs> excuse me, those are all areas that are important to any startup. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure, again, that his experience at this very specialized kind of company um, that we were making that relevant to any startup. So all of those um, areas are important for him to highlight. So once he had those areas, then he tells a, a mini before and after story within each one of them. And let's just look at one of them uh, as an example. So starting with his strategy development and execution, his first bullet uh, talks about his analysis of markets. And he says that he initiated rigorous industry, competitive and product feasibility analyses to develop more nuanced market views and more realistic plans for product development and growth. So what is that? two-line sentence tells me. It tells me that he's not a fly-by-the-seat-of-his-pants kind of uh, strategy guy. He really took the time to do the, the hard uh, market analysis, the data-driven stuff that really enabled him to present to the company um, a very smart uh, refocusing of their, of their whole business. Right. Well, and I love the way he's using um, you know, words that, again, product development, growth, that's a phrase that anyone might be used, yep. might use, but he's talking, it, giving it some context. He's yep. telling the story, so realistic plans exactly. for actually doing exactly. that. Exactly. And then he goes on to tell the rest of his strategy story. So we won't go through the whole thing, but in the second bullet, he says he established a B2B focus in the company, that he transformed it. Uh, the company that had been responding uniformly to every B2B and B2C request, no matter how low the ROI was, and he got the company to refocus exclusively on its most profitable uh, B2B customers, such as public transit agencies. This in and of itself is an amazing story, right? Mm. He pulled off at Axion what most companies that I'm familiar with struggle with all the time, which is how do you decide which customers are just not worth your time and, and, and resources and get rid of them, oh my God, and which companies should you exclusively focus on? And he pulled that off, so very, very impressive. Um, I would just point out the last one here, that he notes that he maximized profitability. Again, he's noting that it's not he's not just a revenue driver, he's a profitability driver, and he backs it up with some very specific information about how um, he turned Axion's rail customers from a negative 10% to a positive 25% margin. So mm -hmm. he backs up his, his claims with the numbers. And this is a, this use of numbers yep. um, is something I hear a lot about, quantifiable achievements. Um, what if you have a job that's not about the numbers? Yep. How do you, you know, work that in? Yep. Um, so <coughs> usually there is a number in there somewhere, but if there really isn't, um, there are other ways of demonstrating uh, the results of your uh, of the improvements that you've uh, launched and led at a company. For example, if you are in the HR business or uh, um, learning and development business, um, I've worked with clients who've noted the number of um, people who've signed up for their trainings, mm -hmm. uh, the positive results of those trainings as evidenced by um, the uh, 
the participants um, scoring evaluations mm. of the sessions right. as evidenced by the number of attendees who went on to get promoted to higher positions within their companies, um, the, their managers who, who noted in their annual reviews that their performances had improved significantly because of the training. So there's, there's always something in there. It may not be as numeric as Williams was, but there's always something in there where you can actually um, articulate the results of the accomplishments. Okay, so focusing on the change you've had, yeah. the accomplishments. Yeah. Think of your resume as kind of a before and after story mm. of everything that you've done at that company. What was it like when you got there? What did you orchestrate that made the performance of the company so much better? Yeah, that's a helpful way to think about it. What other advice do you have for our viewers around this section, how they should tackle it themselves? Yeah. So, um, as we mentioned earlier, the first thing to do when you're tackling your experience section is to reread that job posting that you'd kill to get. Make sure you've got your five or six point um, checklist of the things that are most important for that job posting. Keep that checklist very much in hand. Um, start out by writing a very brief introduction to your work, either at the company, if you've had more than one position, as William has, or in a particular position. And what will go in the introduction are things like, um, the type of company it is, if that's not obvious. Um, your personal growth at that company, if you went for, from example, for, from a sales rep to the VP of sales, very mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah. Um, the size team that you led, the size budget and P&L that you were responsible for, and overall, the growth that the company experienced that you either led yourself or were a major contributor to. So, um, again, Williams is a bit long. Um, yours may end up being only a couple, three lines at the most. Mm -hmm. Once you have that intro, you're ready to list the, the subsections that are most important to that job that you're applying for. And then once you have those subsections, you're ready to write your much more concrete um, bullets within each of those sections. And always focusing on what did you accomplish? What was the problem you solved? What was the challenge you met? How did you do it? And what were the results? As concretely as you possibly can. Got it. Okay, so let's, it sounds like we might have some viewer questions about this experience section. We do, we're getting quite a few questions on this section. A few viewers have noticed that there's a lot of text on William's resume. Um, some people are asking, shouldn't it be more concise? Will HR really read all this? Mm. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, that is a good mm -hmm. question. And I would say that if you've written your headline and summary section effectively enough, that one of the main purposes of this section is to motivate somebody to read all the rest of it more carefully. So um, again, William certainly could have been somewhat shorter, but <coughs> I would say that given the extensiveness of his experience, the length of his is warranted. Yours may not need, need to be this long, but yes, um, the, the viewer is absolutely right to ask about length. But again, I would strongly suggest that if you're focusing on the headline and summary, motivating somebody to keep reading becomes uh, much easier. Right. And I think what you've done also is made it quite skimmable yep. in that you have this highlighted heading, you, you know, all of the pertinent information is, is bolded or even underlined. Yep. So someone who wants to skim yep. is still going to get a lot from reading this resume, certainly more than from the before where most you're skimming, you're reading these headers which are taking up so much right. real estate. Another question. So Bianca is asking, how do you display promotions within the same company? Should, be, should it be a separate section under experience? Um, not a separate section. So <coughs> um, if I were writing the introduction to this section for someone who had had multiple positions, and I've worked with lots of clients who've done that, you could say something like, um, that's part of your introduction. So you want to say something like, um, I mean, I literally I just finished working with someone who had started as a sales rep in a company where she happened to have worked for 30 years, uh, very unusual, but she literally started as a sales rep. She moved up the rank. She had three or four promotions within sales to the point where she was VP of sales. Then she broadened her um, uh, positions even more and became the SVP and then the EVP and then the president of the entire North American division. That two-line statement of her very impressive growth was, was the first part of her introduction to her work at this particular company. So always incorporated in within the body of what you're, of the story that you're telling for that particular company. Don't separate it out as a separate section. You want to keep it all as cohesive as possible. You're telling a story. Um, think about that as your, what's your narrative? Yeah. Another question. 
So we'll take one more question on experience. Great. Elizabeth is asking, for this section, do you have to put dates? Could you instead put the number of years at a certain company you've worked? She, mentioned, she mentions that she knows a lot of people over 50 who are worried about age discrimination. Hmm. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I have never done a uh, number of years. Um, to me, that, that almost is more of a highlighting. It's kind of a red flag that says, I'm trying to hide something here. Uh, I'm not saying you should never try it. And I would actually be interested in working with someone who, who wanted to try that, <coughs> that format, but I don't recommend it generally. O often there's some interesting information you get just by noting what the, the years are, because there may have been something going on in the economy or in that particular industry that was um, particularly important for that time period. Um, so I wouldn't say unequivocally, no, don't do that, but uh, it's a little, a little yeah. iffy. It, and, because it's so unusual, I think it would it would draw attention to yeah. it. I mean, yeah. I think one thing that's important to note, though, that if your work history goes back to the 60s, the 70s, you don't have to include it no, all, right? No, you're no, just no. including what's pertinent to the job you're applying exactly. for. Exactly. Lots of people cut off their resumes, and I, this is a pretty good rule of thumb. Don't talk about anything more than 20 years of experience, and even that may be too long, depending on, like if, if the work that you did early, early in your career is not relevant to the kind of work that you're now looking for, feel free to just leave it off. Right, okay. Well, great, let's summarize um, the takeaways from the experience section, how you can tackle this yourself. Um, first, show the positive change that you had at the job. Anything that you influenced that where the job grew or you grew personally, include that. Break each, each section into d descriptive subsections, similar to what um, William did. Um, use two to four bullets that demonstrate accomplishments. The focus is really on accomplishments there. Start with strong action words that capture the reader's attention, and then describe quantifiable, concrete accomplishments whenever possible. And quantifiable doesn't necessarily have to be the size of a P&L, but it can be the size of the team or ratings, customer ratings, employee ratings that you um, somehow influenced. Now, we don't have the time to go over every section of William's resume, but I do want to ask just once about the skills section. So he had a skills section in his early draft. It's not here in the, in the second draft. Why is that? Right. Good question. Um, certainly, you would assume that you want to highlight skills in your resume, and I would argue that your entire resume is about your skills, so you don't need to, uh, you don't need to um, qu uh, quarantine it off in a separate <laughs> section. But if you look at uh, William's um, early skills section, and this is very typical of um, what many people include in their resumes, it's mostly about his proficiency in various software programs. He's got MS Office 365, HubSpot, Microsoft Dynamics, CRM, Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. So why isn't that useful information? Well, William, had he gone on to pursue um, other opportunities with startups, he would, he would have been applying for very high level VP or up positions where his proficiency in these software systems is either taken for granted and therefore not necessary to include here. It would be like my saying, I know how to type. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, um, uh, yeah, so not necessary for the kind of positions he's applying for. And he's likely managing people who yeah, have these skills, right, right? right? I mean, it's not horrible that he has had actual experience with it, because if he's going to a tiny startup, he might need to be using those yeah. systems. But again, who's ever reading the resume will assume that he has that proficiency. Yeah. On the other hand, if the kind of positions that you're applying for do have um, a particular software program as a key requirement of that position, by all means include it, but don't include it here. Look how far down, oops, it is in his resume. It's likely that no one will even read it that far down. Mm. So instead, if it's really central to the position you're applying for, put it up here in your summary section and, and integrate it into the experience section. Of make, your it, make it part of the story, exactly. so to speak, right? Exactly. And that if, the, if the job description calls for certain skills, yeah. you certainly want to highlight those, Absolutely. but you don't need to put it in this sort of addendum Absolutely. at the end of the resume. Absolutely. Well, great. So let's take, I know we probably have a lot of questions about resumes, so um, let's go ahead and take a few questions. Great, so one question we're getting a lot is how designed should a resume be? So Helen wants to know what are your thoughts on including icons or charts or graphics? Hmm. Okay, I will admit to having a particular bias uh, in this area, which is I am a big proponent of clean, simple, elegant uh, 
formatting. I wouldn't even call this designed. Um, even Williams is a, his the the pre version of his resume is a little bit too designed. That's the square for me. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's what you're saying that needs to be the the highlighting of your resume, not how you've designed it. So I have certainly seen resumes where people have you know a separate column over here with icons and blah blah blah. Um, it's, it's not, I'm not saying don't ever do it, um, but it's not my particular preference, and I would much rather use the very precious, you know, really, your resume should be no more than, in most cases, not in Williams, but two pages is about an ideal length for a resume, and you want to use that space really, really, really carefully. So um, I, I tend to veer away from design and to focus much more on a clean and simple uh, formatting that is easy to scan. Um, again, remember that those people reading your resumes don't have much time, and they need a really quick way of skimming it and quickly saying, wow, this is somebody I, I need to read more carefully. I'm going to put them in the to-be-read-carefully pile, not in the recycle bin. Great. Another question. So Carlos is asking, how do you address experience that you have that's relevant but only appears through short-term jobs? That's fine. Um, as long as you, the key word there is relevant. Um, if you've done something really relevant and impressive, if you've orchestrated a change in a mere six months, it's absolutely fine to just put it in the descending chronological order of your, of your resume. Again, I'm, I'm less concerned about the length of your employment in a particular position than what did you do there? What, you know, how did you, what was your legacy in that position? What important changes did you make happen? How did the performance of the business improve because of you? And I can imagine, Jane, you might say, you know, instead of having the name of the company, you might say software developer, yeah. and then have the years, and you can say, Absolutely. you know, filled a variety of short-term roles over, yeah. you know, 10 years yeah. that blah, 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 Absolutely. and then uh, highlight the relevant skills Absolutely. there, right? Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to be by company. It could also be by, by the role you filled. Uh, it could be, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, a lot of people, um, uh, rather than in, as we did with William, instead of putting the company name first, list the position title first, which is absolutely fine, and you could certainly group a bunch of sh short-term positions together. Right. Yeah. Yep. Another question. So Yael and a few others are wondering whether you should put references on a resume or whether you should include a picture. Oh. <laughs> um, both good questions. Um, in terms of references, um, a lot of people include at the very end references available upon request. Some people actually go to the trouble of actually listing the references with their contact information. Um, I don't recommend that for the very simple reason that you unlikely to have enough space for it. If somebody needs a reference, they will ask you for it. It's assumed that those references are available. Right, and that does take up valuable. It does take up valuable space. What about the picture? Um, I've never included a picture um, on a resume again, because I, no one's ever asked me to, and um, I'm again, I'm not saying don't ever try this, but you know, <laughs> you could try it at home <laughs> yourself. <laughs> um, see how it looks. I mean, really, you want to you want to kind of step back from whatever your near final version of your resume and say you know, eyeball it. What does it look like? How easy will it be for, to, for someone to read? And is it taking up valuable real estate? Again, remember that this is the most important section of your resume. And if you're putting your picture up here, is that the most important piece of uh, information you want to be communicating? The other reason to consider not including a picture is um, most people include uh, their LinkedIn uh, profile URL, which obviously does have your picture. So if you're um, if you think that somebody reading your resume will want to look at, at you in all your glory, they can certainly do it on your LinkedIn page. Great. Another question. So Grace is asking, how do you overcome being considered overqualified when more experience might be less valued? Mm. Um, it all comes back, it's a very good question, but it all comes back to um, when you read that job posting that you're applying for, what was most important to them, and did you then highlight all of what was most important to that position? position in your resume and you know you obviously wouldn't be highlighting the the aspects of your work that that are overqualified mm -hmm. um, for that position you would be emphasizing the things that are in fact 
most closely a match to what that position is looking for. But you're not suggesting to omit job titles um, or experiences. You're just saying highlight the things that would be most relevant. Yes, is that absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. You're always trying to build a bridge between what you've done in the past and what that future position is looking for. So someone can imagine that you would come in and literally be ready to roll up your sleeves and help them you know, deal with the challenges that they're facing because you have dealt with those challenges in previous positions uh, in, your, in your past work life. Great. Let's take another question. So Manoj and a few others are asking, how do you differentiate between professional experience and academic experience? We've, we've even had a few questions from people asking, you know, what about fresh graduates who don't have much professional experience? Mm. Let's talk right. about academic versus professional. Right. Um, Is there a difference? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> so um, one of the most unusual resumes I, are, I ever got from a client was from someone, from a, a physician, who um, not only had extensive years of experience clinically, but he also had a very impressive academic uh, background. And his resume, believe it or not, was 50 pages long. And wow. why, you may <laughs> ask, was it that long? I, I, I kept having to look at the file because it kept printing. I thought, this couldn't possibly be that long. <laughs> um, and it, in his defense, he had listed all of his academic positions, which were many, all of the publications that he had um, written during those years in academia. So if he were applying to an academic position, that information, probably somewhat condensed, um, would be relevant. But if he were applying for uh, an executive position at a hospital, which is actually what he needed help with, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, again, is less relevant. So. Um, it's again the same story, and pardon me for repeating it, but what's most relevant to the position that you're applying for? If, if you were applying to an ac academic position, by all means, figure out how to communicate that effectively because that's part of what you've accomplished. And put that first, right? You would want that yeah. in your summary. You yeah. would want that, your, that academic experience to show up first. Yep, yeah, but it's unlikely that you'll be simultaneously applying for both an academic position and, a, and a, in his case, a clinical position. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide which aspect of your background is most important, most relevant to, to highlight in your resume. You may end up, in, if, if you are, if you've spent a, long, a lot of time in academia and are applying for an academic position, that's one thing, but if, you've, if you are kind of hedging your bets and applying for both an academic position and a corporate position, mm -hmm. you may have to have two different resumes um, or you may have to have uh, an especially long resume, but you want to clearly um, label those sections again so that somebody can very easily decide which, of, which sections of your resume to read yeah. uh, first. What about the second part of the question? The person who has, you know, a recent graduate has very yeah. little work experience. Yeah. How do you fill the page? <laughs> right. So someone who's literally just graduated from college might be the only example that I can imagine where um, you only need one page, and that's fine. Um, I actually worked with someone who, um, she hadn't even graduated from college. She had um, taken a leave of absence from college and she was applying for a teaching position. Um, and in her case, uh, in her one page resume, um, we, she was applying for an early childhood teaching position and we emphasized the work that she had done during the summers working with kids um, at camps and in after school programs. So we, we considered all of her work, whether it was paid or not, as work worthy of highlighting because it was absolutely relevant to the teaching positions that she was applying for. So it's hard for me to imagine that someone even who has just graduated from college hasn't had some work experience. So those are the things that you want to uh, include there. And again, make sure that, that you've done that checklist of the jobs that you're applying for and what's most relevant to them and then highlight those. Great. Another question. So one question we're getting is, how do you describe accomplishments when it comes to quality, but not quantity? Right, so we've touched on that a little bit, but there are lots of uh, examples. So um, let's see if we can pull out one from, from well, William's resume. This his established marketing function, right? That's not a quantifiable, but that was really about the, the quality of the work he did from right. start to finish. Right, right. So that's an example that he established this marketing function. You could say um, a lot of people who are applying for um, mid to high level management positions have as a section, William doesn't happen to have it, but um, 
you could have a separate section uh, in your experience that in, in, within a position that talks about your talent acquisition and team building. Mm -hmm. um, those aren't usually con numerically quantifiable, but you could certainly say, you know, um, recruited the best and brightest, pardon that, uh, that phrase, but mm -hmm. because of my deep network um, of people in the industry, um, you know, built a editorial team from scratch um, which went on to win X number of, of awards in the national magazine category. So those kinds of things are not, they're not numeric quantifiers, mm -hmm. but they're still absolutely, they, they demonstrate the results of, of your work and what you accomplished. Right. And I've even seen a resume where it said, you know, 50% of the people I hired went on to get a, a yeah. promotion within two years, yeah. right? So that's a way to quantify absolutely. something yeah. that feels more um, soft, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Another question. So maybe one, we have time for one or two more questions. Okay. Um, but how much non-professional experience should someone include on their resume? Like volunteer experience or civic engagement or their interests? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that's a very common question. And a, a lot of people, if, if you look at William's resume, he actually had this huge volunteer um, section on Half his. Half a page. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the question of whether or not to include volunteer work is, is a really good one. Um, and again, pardon me for being such a broken record, but it goes back to what's relevant to the jobs that you're applying for. If the work that you have done as a volunteer is relevant to that new job that you're applying for, by all means, figure out a way to incorporate it in your resume, but I would not suggest isolating it in a section labeled volunteer work or volunteer leadership. I don't care that you've done it as a volunteer or as a paid person. What I care about is, is the work meaningful to the kind of work that I need you to do in my company. So I would just, um, do we have that example? Yeah, we can put up an example on the, on the screen of a volunteer section that, yeah. that works well. So I worked with someone who um, had spent, her, I think, her entire career in the publishing business um, very successfully. And she was now going on to make a pretty drastic change uh, in her career. And she was looking for um, executive positions within nonprofit uh, organizations. She had done um, a couple, three different um, volunteer uh, stints on boards of various organizations. So what we did was we described those um, briefly, but in not dissimilar ways from the way we described any other um, work accomplishment. And we incorporated them into the descending chronological order of her entire resume. Mm. So. Um, if we have that up on screen, you'll see how we highlighted the, um, so uh, she did work, um, she was on the National Board of Trustees for the March of Dimes uh, in Connecticut, and she notes that she helped advance the mission to fund initiatives to end premature birth, birth defects, and infant mortality, but then she goes on to note that she was, a as a member of the Development and Marketing Committee, she provided advice on communicating with millennial women, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, those, the way we highlighted her work there is not dissimilar from the way we would have highlighted her work in the publishing business. Um, but she had a couple of examples like that that were just incorporated into the overall chronology yeah. um, of her resume, of the experience section of her resume. So treat volunteer experience as you would professional experience yeah. and include it if it's relevant. Yes, yeah. absolutely, if it's relevant. And um, don't worry about including it if it's not relevant. If you are hell-bent on including it at the very end, in a one-liner kind of thing, feel free. Yeah. Um, as, as one of my clients said, you never know. This person decided to include things like her, her far-flung backpacking adventures, um, which I normally would not have recommended including. But she said, you, know, never, you never know. That might have been the one thing that got somebody's attention. Mm -hmm. um, I would, of course, maintain that all the rest of her resume would have gotten that person's attention also. But right. either way, it's fine. Great. Well, let's take one more question. Well, the most common question we're getting is, can people access or download William's resume to help them tailor their own? Ah, ah. so we do, w William's resume is indeed in um, one of the pieces that Jane wrote. Yep. So um, I know you've been posting, Nicole, 
um, some of those pieces. Jane, do you remember the title of that piece so um, we can highlight it? Yeah, it was something like uh, Turn Your Resume Bullets Into Stories. I can't remember the exact title, but... Um, Nicole will find it yeah. and, and put it into the comments so people can, they, they can see um, William's resume. Yeah, there. again, William was very gracious to allow us to include his entire resume and a link to his LinkedIn page yeah. <laughs> in that article. So yeah. you'll learn a lot of stuff about William yeah. um, and you can see his charming picture on his LinkedIn page. Um, do remember when you're looking at it that his resume is now a couple of years old. Yeah. So because this is a workshop, I wanted to just summarize our key takeaways from what Jane has graciously um, shared with us today. First, remember that your resume is a marketing document. You are the product. You are trying to sell yourself to a hiring manager or to a recruiter. Um, you only have a short time to capture the reader's attention. Therefore, please include a summary section. That's really what's going to grab um, the person's eye and make them want to read more. Don't cram it on one page unless you're a brand new graduate and don't have much experience. Um, you have to make sure it's readable. Use your white space, use bold, underline to make it skimmable um, and a pleasant experience for the, for the hiring manager to read. And lastly, highlight accomplishments, um, not just responsibilities. The hiring manager wants to know why the organization you worked at is better because of, of your work there. So we want to thank Jane Heifetz so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, and we'll see you soon.